it's my time, think it's my year, yeah. Tuesday, welcome to the morning show, Stock Market TV, Spencer, JC, Steve Alfonso with you on this fine, fine, beautiful Tuesday morning, at least here in the Northeast. What's on the docket for today? We're talking earnings. We've got to talk about that. We are in earnings season, so we got some banks, we got some healthcare, we got some pharma, we'll talk about that, we'll talk about uh, bonds, uh, this correction underneath the surface happening in the stock market, uh, and crypto for that matter, probably too. Um, our guest today, Mike Zaccardi, he always brings um, good charts. Also, Mike probably tweets more charts than like anybody else that I that I know. So Mike Zaccardi will be on at 9. Patrick Donawilla from the Chart Report on at 9.30. And that's the rundown for the day. Good morning, chat. Good morning. Let's see. Dawson, Jason, Chris with a beard. C. Marie, Doug, uh, Mark. Bill, acquisitions marketing. Hope you are having a good start to your day. Let's get the show on the road. All right, ladies and gents, happy Tuesday. How we doing? I'm doing fantastic. I'm already getting going on tomorrow's conference call. Very excited. Very lot to talk about. Good, good. Uh, what are you seeing out there? Well, uh, bond market continues to crash. I know you keep telling me that this is not a crash, but this is uh, this is a crash. And you know, Spencer's talking about a, a stock market correction underneath the surface. I don't think it's underneath the surface. I think it's front and center. You got the Dow Jones Industrial Average flat for the year. Flat. 0, 0.0, Mr. Blutarski. Its largest component, though, not flat today. 0. 0. 0.0. So good. So good, Spencer. Well done. Well done. Uh, UNH? Yeah. UNH is up 7% this morning. You know, we tend to see these patterns not end up being tops in bull markets. So I, I think this is encouraging from a, a broader information standpoint, seeing UNH dig in and really rebound hard off of uh, these old lows. Yeah, Microsoft, uh, Microsoft catching up in terms of uh, largest uh, largest component in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Catching up, maybe not after today. Yeah. Um, what do you say? Uh, what do we say? We hit those markets there, Spencer. Sure. Yeah the right one today how about that um all right let's do a quick little rundown dow futures up 230 points this morning hello it's about 60 basis points pretty much what it was up yesterday uh in the morning uh s p futures up 20 basis points 10 handles that's uh 51 15 on the s p 500 nasdaq futures up a little bit as well up 22 points there, 14 basis points. Bond market down again, almost like if that's the trend, 30-year bond futures down once again, uh, trying to hang on to 114 for dear life. Gold up again, just under 2,400 for gold, up a third of a percent. And you got silver down over 1%, 28 and change. Copper down almost 2%, but hovering there at 430. Uh, crude oil flat right around 85 bucks dollar mix in early trading yen down euro up uh, you got the volatility index almost at 19 closed above 19 yesterday highest levels in, in four or five months so you know when you talk about correction under the surface seems front and center to me um and then when you go look at over at the uh the old funny money what are we looking at we got bitcoin uh bitcoin pretty much flat 63,300. ethereum pretty much flat uh, just under 3100 uh, there for Ethereum. And they might as well just, um, you know, close it out like we usually do. Solana down to 135. Solana's down 65 points pretty quickly. Uh, what's that math work out to? About a 30 something percent correction in Solana? That was fast. Uh, total crypto market cap, Spencer Israel, $2.24 trillion and continuing to fall. All right. You know, I, I, at this point, call me when we're below two. But yeah, semantics, right? What you said about silver stands out more than anything for me because it's across the board. Uh, 
in the entire sector right now. I'm not talking about commodity futures, I'm talking about commodity stocks. So when you look at materials, whether it's you know the steel index, the chemicals index, the copper index, you could even look at the ETFs themselves, COPX, you know, running into a shelf of former highs. Silver, look at the BlackRock fund, SLV, running into a shelf of old highs. Uh, SLX, same thing. I didn't realize I didn't realize silver was BlackRock. Uh, SLV. Yeah. iShares, right? Not surprising, yeah. but I just didn't know. That's interesting. Um, why don't we uh, why don't we take a look at the bond crash? A little update there. Uh, bonds bounced back in the fourth quarter with stocks peaked on December the twenty seventh. It's literally been a straight down, straight line down ever since. New five month lows uh, yesterday for U.S. Treasury bonds. Um, looks like a crash to me. No? I mean, I'm not gonna. It, first of all, it doesn't matter what it is. The price is going down, right? And that's what pays you. Uh, second of all, you, literally by definition, JC, you need volatility if you want to call something a crash. And if you go look at the chart of bond market volatility, it would not support what you're saying. That's my only point. I don't know why you keep talking about this crash. I don't care. Oh, I'm just breaking crash, balls. Fantastic. Oh, why do I talk about the crash? Because this is, I don't know, the most important market on earth that keeps going down. So that's why I keep talking about it because it's a big deal. Well, you, well, you should have shorted it then. There were easier trades. There have been easier trades. I got no problem with it. Like, it's not so much like shorting bonds as it is recognizing that the trend for bonds is down and the trend for rates is up. How do we take advantage of that? I have yeah. been in the camp that there are easier, better trades than just shorting bonds, and that has worked out in my favor. So that's the answer. But it's the same answer that I give you every time you ask me. So it's nothing changed, right? There's better I'm trades, good. no? I'm good with the bonds conversation. I, I will say I was listening this morning. Uh, I always like to listen to Mike Novogratz when he talks. I own a lot of his stock, but I also like his thoughts on Bitcoin and the broader market. This guy, and we've talked about him on, on here before. He's not new to Wall Street. So he said what we just got past couple of months were de facto rate hikes, right? Because market expectations went from seven cuts this year to two. The dumbest shit I've ever heard. Who cares? No, like I, I, no, I, I'm not. Talking, I'm not saying to you, but like just generally speaking, like these people obsessed with what the Fed's gonna do every day. Like, well, wow. He, he had a read through on it, right? So just like we do, we take information from the bond market and then apply it to the stock market and other risk assets. He said the big takeaway there, going from seven cuts to two, is look at stocks, look at risk assets. Right? They were giving them a hard time the interviewer about Bitcoin and crypto Who's the interviewer, Andrew Ross Sorkin. He's such a prick. So, and, and this is on YouTube, CNBC, CNBC. It, it, it's on the giant TV box. Why is, why is he such a prick? He wrote a good book back in the day. He's, he likes to argue. He's very political. I don't wow, care. You call him out like that. All right. He's no, I don't, don't enjoy him anyway. Um, the, Nova wait, what was the book he wrote? I liked his book. What was the book? No idea. Too big to fail. Too big to fail. Too big to fail. That's a good book. Also, also a decent movie. So yeah. listen, his takeaway about it all was: look at risk assets. Look at how well they're holding up, right? In the face of higher interest rates, de facto rate hikes, what you call them, whether you agree or not, who knows? Um, but look at stocks; they've done really well in the face of that. So, JC, you talk about it all the time: stocks and bonds and the correlation. Bonds are crashing. Look at stocks; they're crashing. Right. And look at stocks. So it's not a bad thing. Why don't we look at the why don't we look at asset returns? Because it's yeah. it's not so much for me, uh, stocks on an absolute basis, but it's really the dramatic underperformance of stocks in the face of ripping commodities, which is the bigger trade, right? It's not like stocks, some will do well, some will do poorly. You know, they could do well with rising rate environments, they could do poorly with rising rate environments. To your point, stocks have held in pretty well. There hasn't been any bond market volatility, right? The stock market is not so much obsessed with the direction of rates as it is the stock market just doesn't like rates to be moving very fast in either direction, to be clear. The bigger theme here is with this with this uh, bond market crash, it's the severe underperformance out of the stock market. I mean, just year to date, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the world's most important stock market index, hasn't gone anywhere. It's at the same place it started the year. This is, the, this is the most important stock market index in the world. When people tell me how great stocks are doing, how about the Russell 2000, 
uh, down over 2%, still below last year's highs, right? S&P and Q's up 5 6%. That's respectable, no doubt about it. It's the underperformance of the NASDAQ and the S&P 500. Look at oil, up 22.5% this year. Silver up over 20%. Gold up monster moves. Even copper doing very well. And then look at uh, look at treasury bonds down below that, almost 10%. Right? So the it's Russell, more the, the relative performance, Strazzy. You feel me? The Russell 2000, uh, and more than that, value line, the average stock, what a disappointment. Disappointment to who? I mean, this base is just taking forever. And it looked like it was going you know, coming into this year and really failing miserably. All of those, all of those late reversals are kind of back in the box, back in their old ranges, look a lot like this. It's no good. Throw up, uh, throw up slide five there, Spencer. You know, so you were looking at the largest, so the technology index is the largest component of the S&P 500 by far, and the small cap, and then technology is the largest component in small caps, right? Yep. So um, small cap tech, actually the worst performing small cap index, which I suppose makes sense with the bond market crashing, interest rates ripping, technology should struggle, and then small cap should struggle. So small cap technology are the ones struggling the most. That makes sense, right? The market doesn't always make sense, but in this case, that makes perfect sense, right? That's, per that's very logical. So uh, large cap tech, uh, lowest level since mid-February, small cap tech, Lowest level since November, already down 10% this year. Yeah, and I want to throw up, I love this, and I want to show a chart of equal weight tech also. In the chat, um, something about why are we talking like like we weren't just in a really strong bull market. I still we'll think still we're post. in a strong bull market. The primary trend is very much intact, right? We're talking about so. tactical damage here. Um, so... Momentum divergences, they don't really matter until they do. What do you think about that? Hot take? Well, what, I think what this project and about whatever this person says, saying that we were in an unstoppable market like a few short weeks ago, that's that that's just mathematically incorrect. It wasn't unstoppable. Um, it was breath, has thing breath has been deteriorating for a while. Yeah, breath has but. been deteriorating all year. So there's nothing unstoppable about this. Quite the opposite. I'm actually surprised at how well the indexes have held up, despite just how terrible uh, it's been underneath the surface. I think like the maybe the difference is surprisingly the, strong. <laughs> the, the difference is a few weeks ago, you were, you, uh, you at least had some clear momentum movers, right? And now, yes. and now you don't. Uh, right. Anyway, bullish over intermediate and long, longer term time frame. Yeah. All I right. Mean, yeah. The trends, the trends are up bigger picture. Uh, it's the short term and intermediate term that are down trends and sideways trends. So know your time frame. Okay. Momentum divergences. They've been obnoxious. I've been taking RSI off my charts this year, which is not uncommon for me. Um, really, prices peaked, what, a few weeks ago? I guess a month, month and a half ago. Momentum peaked back in December for most things, most indexes, most individual components. Same time breath peaked, middle of December, and it's been waning ever since. Depending on what indexes you look at, you know, you'll see different pictures, but this is pretty representative of what you're seeing, particularly in the growth of your indexes, it's equal weight technology. The art of momentum divergences uh, is quite subjective, right? You, you want to look for something called confirmation, and different people are going to do that in different ways, and there's not a right or wrong answer. For me, you kind of have to look to the price chart and figure it out. The last time it got overbought was in January, uh, and we have that marked. Last overbought, I'm calling it a confirmed high. You have to look for some sort of break of a prior high, right, at a at an overbought momentum reading to confirm the divergence uh, from a bearish point of view. I think we have that here, right? Momentum is plunging to its low, lowest level since October. Another down day or two, you're going to have an oversold reading, right, which would be a major change in character. Below the 50-day moving average, inter intermediate uh, term moving average, price hitting its lowest level since February, taking out the pivot highs from early Q1. We're seeing a lot of momentum divergences confirm across the board. That doesn't mean like a new bear market's coming, or even that we have to enter some sort of steep corrective phase here. Uh, Strazzi, but, you want to know? You want to know the chart that tells the story? What? I'll show you the chart that tells the story. We talked about it in our meeting last week, our internal meeting. Throw up slide two, Spencer. This is everything you need to know. I'm telling you right now, for everybody, if you out there listening, this is everything you need to know. This tells the story of the current stock market environment to me to a T. 
So what are we looking at? Nothing to we're do with momentum. At... What? This has nothing to do with momentum, but okay. I understand. But tell me if yeah. this doesn't tell the story. This is the percentage of stocks in the S&P 500 that are above their 200-day moving average, which is a longer-term uptrend, mm -hmm. but below their 50-day moving average, which in the short to intermediate term would make it either a sideways trend or a downtrend. So the fact that we're hitting the highest levels in several years in the percentage of stocks that fit the profile of above a 200-day moving average but below their 50-day moving average, that's the story, Straza. How is it not? I would argue based on this chart, uh, a high reading here isn't necessarily a very bad thing. We had a really high reading right around the same time we had monster initiation thrusts in 2020. No, no one's saying it's a bad thing. No one's saying it's a bad thing. I'm just yeah. telling you, this is the state of the markets. Longer term uptrends, short to intermediate term, messy or downtrends. Yeah, but That's my exactly question what you said before. My question is, does it matter if um, a stock is in an intermediate, a short term downtrend or just a sideways trend? Shouldn't that matter? Uh, it's surprising to see this at a higher level than October. That's, whew. there are more stocks above their 200 day moving average. Right. And then, you know, they got, they got very extended beyond their 200 day, as you know. So now they're falling below their 50 day. That's why that wasn't the case in the fall where there were still stocks that had, had yet to break out in that fourth quarter. Right. You feel me? So it's more the setup and it's not, and I don't want you guys to think about all right, so what are the broader market implications of this situation? That's not what this is for. It's to reiterate, these are the current state of the markets. It doesn't mean that it's bad for the next six months or good for the next six months. This is just a market that we're in right now. That's all it means. It's also that there hasn't been momentum in a while, right? It's the same thing that we were just talking about with momentum. Momentum has been waning. So these 50-day moving averages have been cresting. So they're easier to violate than they were in periods coming off of really strong momentum. Prices are elevated from their 50 day. And what does that mean, cresting? Lot. What does that mean, cresting? Turning sideways would be cresting. cresting. That's a new word for me. That's a thing. No, cresting is like okay. peaking. Think, think, think of right, but it's got to turn sideways to peak. Talk about a moving average, right? Yeah. You know, it peaks and roll rolls over. Is it not cresting? That's a new yeah. word. Like cresting the crest of a wave. Is an ornamental decoration at the ridge of a roof or top of a wall or screen that is a cresting i don't need you to tell me what it means this we is know, a new word for means. me i'm just asking i don't i just don't understand what that means like a wave like the crest of a wave this is, this is like new? a connecticut thing that you guys call a hero a grinder is that one of those weird <laughs> connecticut things Andrew, help me out here i don't JC, jc uh when when a wave like in the ocean oh is that a, got it is got that it. its biggest right understood it, 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 it's it's cresting got right? it Okay. But they all roll over is the crest, don't they, in a wave? That's what Steve is saying. Understood. See, that's why I ask questions. You learn things, right? Yeah, Come on, great. chat. Are we all learning here together? Glad I, glad I could be of service today. They had <laughs> the same discussion on animal spirits. Did you see that? Uh, all right. Not is that where you got this verb, this term, cresting? No, I didn't. I didn't hear that. I haven't listened to their show in a while. He's a, he, Straz is a fanboy of the old Animal Spirits podcast. Love those guys. But this is yeah. not a new word for me. And it, it It's not a new word for me, too. It's just kind of like, uh, you know, what, what is it? Uh, oh, one of those old man moments? What do they call them? Senior moments. Senior moments. It's no. a senior moment, Straz. You'll, you'll get there. You'll see one day. When Boomer you have as many alert. kids as I do. Oh, yeah. He's got kids, Spencer. All right. <laughs> I'm going to go uh, heat up my coffee, get ready for this interview. We could also talk about the Baker Bros article. I think we should talk about these UNH earnings. Uh, big, Really big move here this morning. I would love to talk about some banks today. Can we talk about small caps? Straza, you can, you can go. Uh, Spencer, why don't you throw up slide, uh, slide eight there? I think this is just a really interesting one. Uh, you've got the the Russell 2000 small cap index and the S&P 600 small cap index, both making new multi-month lows uh, down across the board this year, right? Never broke out. You know, you had lies, fake news, fake news out there about uh, breath improvement in small caps. Simply wasn't true. And then go back, go back to the next slide there. Uh, Spencer, and you can see these are the returns. These are small cap returns year to date. This will be slide nine. Small cap returns year to date. Who are the winners? Energy, industrials, materials, and that's it.
right? You can argue even materials uh, haven't been doing great. Energy, industrials, materials, mm. those are the leaders, right? It's, that, it's interesting. That, that, speaks to, that speaks to just the strength in the whole market, right? Not just small caps, right? Well, the order of the, the top to bottom order here is different than large cap sectors, right? Um, not by, I'm not by much, but yeah, sure. Small yeah, cap technology, is. by the way, down 10%. Right. Technology is middle of the pack in the large caps and it's at the bottom here. Um, what else is different here? Well, also remember that these mega cap stocks that are in the large cap technology, none of those are in the small cap technology. No, so I, I remember these are, of course, that, of course, I'm just making an observation. Different. So in the yeah, large I, caps, energy is the leader. Yep. But energy is the leader, energy, leader for both. Yeah, energy is the leader for both. Right. Discretionary struggling in both. Utilities are struggling in both. Health struggling in both. Financials, not so much. Financials up 6% this year, XLF. Right. So again, that's a great point, Spencer. Seriously, great point. Um, and let's un understand why. Small cap financials are a bunch of regional banks. Mm -hmm. There are no regional banks in the XLF. They're all huge institutions. Berkshire well, Hathaway. Well, there is there's the super regionals, if that counts. No. No, they're not in there. All right. They're not, and, and anything that's in there is so meaningless, it doesn't even okay. matter. Berkshire Hathaway is 15% of the XLF. Yeah, I always forget that. Right? So let's keep that in mind. There's no X, There's no Berkshire Hathaway in, in regional bank indexes. This is true. Right? So uh, small cap healthcare is going to be a bunch of biotechs, and small cap financials are going to be a bunch of regional banks. So those two sectors in particular... Um, and you can even argue tech also. They're so different from a large cap to a, a small cap. So different. As opposed to um, energy and utilities where everyone, everyone's more or less in the same business, right? I would say industrials are different, are, are, are kind of the same. They're just bigger and smaller. You know, there's there, no stock in the, the, S, in the large cap industrial sector is more than 4% of the entire index. Yeah, uh, it's a any very commodity, diversified. Any so commodity anything, I would focused. Say industrial small caps and large caps are probably the closest. Also, any commodity focused sector is probably also they're all kind of the same, right? I mean, they all more or less do the same thing. Yeah, they all you know, drill but, oil. But, but the problem they is, all... is that XLE is dominated by Chevron and Exxon, so small cap energy doesn't have that, right? So you're yeah, still but in getting of, that mega yeah, cap yeah. waiting in the large cap energy that you don't get that in industrials. Yeah. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Sure. That's fair. Uh, also, consumer discretionary. You got a ton of Amazon, Home Depot, Tesla in there. In the small caps, you don't, but both of them suck. Large caps and small caps. Wait, what is uh, what is PSCH? What is that? Healthcare. Healthcare. Uh, speaking oh, of Tesla, what? 10% layoffs? Speaking of Tesla, man. 10% low division, was it? Leave, it? leave it to now for people to all of a sudden be concerned about tesla because they're laying off 10 percent of their workforce and i guess there's some some Is notes out this morning workforce? what 10 percent of the entire workforce 10 percent um and uh, uh, there was a note who was it was it jp morgan i forget who who it was from now saying the 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 layoffs they were basically extrapolating the layoffs were a uh, a result of a lack of demand um so now everyone's all of a sudden concerned about tesla they weren't concerned at any point in the last however long it's been since the stock peaked but right. um yeah I, I mean i guess headlines make headlines right so um this it's now been what like over it's been two and a half years right since tesla peaked so um i got a, i got an interesting stat six years ago the patron saint of tslaq Tesla Q, Jim Chanos went on CNBC to explain why he was shorting it. Executive departures, stocks made no progress in years, earnings estimates are falling, incinerating capital. Only six problems. years ago? Tesla has nothing unique. The competition is coming, falling behind in automated technology. Ready? Since then, Tesla stock has gone up 10x, and Chanos' assets under management went from over $6 billion to uh, uh, to under... Two hundred million. Is he still short? Didn't didn't no, he, he shut he shut, it, shut down uh, completely the fund? And is that is that, is that really interesting? Ten x since then. 
Yeah, Chainos is the one that came out and said he's not doing this anymore, right? Yeah, yeah. recently. Yeah. Okay. There was no there was no money in the fund anyway at that point. So it was less, it was two hundred million dollars. It's nothing. It's that's hard. like literally it's not even a small cap stock. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, six billion. I don't know. I thought that just from that. Wow. Yeah. But yeah let yeah. this be a cautionary yeah. tale, right? And this isn't you know, I'm not saying anything about, you know, uh, short strategies or chainos or anything like that. It's more good lesson here. You know, fighting price trends in favor of a a narrative or a story, it's not going to end well. It's not going to end well. Asset prices trend. You're going to fight that? It's tough to do, man. Tough to do. Just like before we bring on Mike Zaccardi, uh, let's just talk you and Atrial fast. Um, since that was the that was kind of the big beat of the day, it's up almost eight percent at the moment one. in the pre market. Uh, top line beat, bottom line beat. They talked a little bit about this uh, the cyber attack and the, the the effect that'll have on the business, but the street sees that as a one time event, so uh, not not a super big deal there. Uh, but they did reaffirm their full year guidance. Um, yeah, eight hundred and seventy-two million dollar hit from the cyber attack, is what they said. Um, eight hundred million. Y- yeah, they, right, that's not so bad. they beat on top and bottom, though. No, they did. They did. The yes. Be, um, the stock's been killed recently, driven lower on all this news. And if you look at the chart, multi-year distribution pattern really just teetering on the edge. Looked like it was going. Uh, and this is one of those just massive classic failed tops, what you tend to see. Not a top. As opposed throw to up, completed throw up slide tops. Two. Throw up slide two. I think it tells the story better. I'll tell you why. Failed you ready? tops. And you got, a little, you, you got a little shake there, too, which you just love to see. Ready, Straza? You like this better, don't you? A little shake and get some. Look at the, look at the color of the arc. Oh. Ah, this is what we're doing now. This is this is a this is a new thing. I love. This it. is my new thing. I'm I into it. Remember, Todd Soane was into it. It's really good. It's really I, good, right? It's a I, bullish top. Yeah, not a top. Jealous. I didn't think of this. Uh, I think I may have done it by accident and been like, "Oh, you know, I'm going to leave that there because it kind of makes sense." I think it may have even been an accident. Too ah, too ah. much. Is it too much to also indicate the uh, line of that gray line of support? A gray line is support. No, no. I mean to change the color so it's not gray. Oh, I'm just kind of like a gray support resistance guy, you know. I'm more okay. of like just shaded area of supply and demand, you know. I like the gray moving averages too. I don't want to call too much attention. I don't like any moving averages. Any moving averages are very distracting. All right. That's that's another recent thing. That was last cycle of uh, a new thing for JC. Well, we had it's not so much a new thing. I have I started. I was the guy with all those moving averages. Right, because I figured if, because the old saying is if you have enough moving averages on your chart, one of them is going to turn into support. Right, yeah, right. So that was my philosophy twenty years ago, and then <laughs> as the years went on, I started eliminating them, eliminating them, eliminating them. and now I only use moving averages really uh, for quantitative purposes, and we do not, use them for quantitative, not, purposes, not visually, by the way. right? Uh, I always want to know the direction of the two hundred, and a lot of times the fifty, because because you need a moving right. average to tell you the direction, right? No, you don't. That was my point from a couple of you years ago. You don't. Some people I, do, no, but, but you it, have looked at enough charts that you could probably draw the 200-day and 50-day up top cr- of your head based cross- on the price Crossovers action. are useful. What? No? no crossovers. No. Crossovers? Crossovers are trash. No? Spencer, punch yourself in the face. Come on. Don't ever say that in my presence again. <laughs> crossovers. Get out of here with your crossovers. All right. All right. better than that, Spencer. All, though, you do want to see the 200 move from sideways to up. I like Spencer, you're better than that, buddy. Come on. Anyhow, I'm, I'm bringing out Meg Zicardi. All right. <laughs> Crossovers. <laughs> Yo, Jay, we've make, been friends for a long time. Make the call. I mean, this is pretty professional, guys. Nice, uh, nice show you got going here. Right? Hey, Mike, what's up? Hey, JC. Hey, Steve. Spencer. How's so, everyone? Um, I was inspired to reach out to Mike because a couple of weeks ago we were talking, JC was talking about people who are both CMTs and CFAs, of which Mike Zaccardi is both. So, JC, you said uh, you don't know anyone that got their CFA 
No, no. I got their CMT first and then got the CFA second. And Mike is one of those. Is he? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay, well, so, you know, I was in college first and I, I failed level one CFA twice and I ditched it and I just went C CMT route and knocked that one out in like 2012 and then went back to CFA and got that. So still though, you know, you know, you know how like in the hot crazy matrix, like they're like, if you find one of these, like put it in a cage and like, so we could study it. You know what I mean? Like, you know, at the end of the hot crazy matrix video, oh, yeah. like, Mike is one of those. Like we want to like trap you, study you very <laughs> fascinating creature. No, God bless you, man. I give you so much props, dude. So well, much props. Well, one quick thing on that. CFA level three is kind of cool because there's so much behavioral finance into it that the CMT material, um, especially like level two, level three CMT, really fed nicely into that piece of it. So it was kind of neat to kind of revisit some things. And I felt like I had a leg up on uh, a lot of the other uh, CFA folks taking it. So that was cool. Did, When's the did next you, exam? What are you taking next? No, no, I'm, little I'm out. A little I'm done. <laughs> I'm done so, for now. A lot more studying for the CFA, no? Yeah. I mean, I, I was always a chart guy first and analyst second, I guess. So, mm. yeah, I always tell like younger folks, like if you're into charts and markets, CMT is at least when I took it, it really wasn't bad. Um, but CFA is a whole other bear. Like it's legit, like 300 hours of studying yep. per exam. You got to be real disciplined. So, yeah, I'd agree with that. Good for you, because once you get older, it's not easy you know, finishing work and then hitting the books. Yeah, I couldn't imagine doing that now. I just I'm so busy writing and following markets. I mean, it's a yeah, it's different, different beast. Well, Mike, why don't you tell the folks, um, you know, tell them a little about your day job, you know, from what sort of lens do you view the markets, you know, with all these letters after your name, you know, there's a there's a day job at the end of the day to, to use these tools, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So like I said, I'm a chart guy first. So I mean, the first thing I'll do in the morning is is, you know, see what futures are doing and pull up just your your normal stocks, bonds, commodities, currencies, see how those intermarket relationships are looking, um, you know, take a look at over the last month or so, what's performing best, what's what's, you know, in the tank. Um, and then, you know, from there, I like to get a sense of what the economic data is doing. So that's kind of where the CFA side plays into it. And then for my day job, it's all about kind of tying th these things together in like a true narrative i mean chart people we like to just look at, at the trend and, and go with that but from a writer's perspective using that to tell the accurate story of the market is really a fun thing and it's, it's cool when you can uh link all those pieces together you say you pay attention to economic data i mean how deep do you go like you're looking at like red book sales and housing starts today and then how do you use that right so What's like a red book sale it's just some of the economic data of today it's uh, retail sales, right? Yeah, it's, it comes out. Okay. Well, they're not actually like books that are read. <laughs> no, I don't think they're read. That would be silly. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there's so much crap out there. And you got US data, global data. You just have to have a feel for, you know, what's relevant right now. Um, so, like, I mean, overnight, we got like that China GDP news. So, I was digging a little bit into that to see why that was above expectations when a lot of the other data that they had released was was actually kind of soft. Mm -hmm. um, and then like I pulled up FXI this morning, it's not doing anything. So it's not like that had a huge impact on uh, on price action today. So uh, do, you think I mean, because, I look, do you think it's because they know China's cooking the books? Well, we always know that. So that's, that's, not, that's nothing new. Um, I don't know. It's all we know is they're buying a lot of gold. So that's, that's one thing. Um, but uh I mean, looking at looking at like B of A and Goldman charts, um, it all helps to form the mosaic of what's happening. So China's got about twenty two hundred tons of gold. Yeah, what's anyone want to do the math? How much money is that? What, what? Why are they? Why are they like stacking gold? Well, we're seeing that with a uh, with central banks around the world, around right? the world right now, just with probably uncertainty in, in the bond market, volatility going on there. Uh, but, you know, I don't think anyone, everyone's kind of just cites that's what's going on. But um, I haven't seen any real evidence-based stuff as to, you know, the the true reasoning why they're doing that. But it 
you know, I think it, it helps. It, it's, it sends like this wave of uncertainty across markets right now, at least that's what makes for the good sound bite. Um, there's, this, this is a lot of zeros. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So I got $168 billion worth of gold for China. That's my math. That doesn't seem like that much. That's what people are so afraid of. It's a lot of gold, dude. 160 billion. You think that's a lot of gold out of what? 15 trillion. What's the out of size? 15 trillion. That doesn't seem like that much. Like for like people to be all like all up in arms about it. I don't know. Well, I put out a chart out there this morning. It is like the fastest pace in the last few decades. So it seems to be at least this decent little tailwind for gold prices right now. And it comes at a time when retail investors are actually stepping out of the gold space. So that's an interesting dynamic when you have gold. And why do, why do you say that? Because of the, the ETF flows? Yeah, just total ET, gold ETF AUM among retail is... Uh, has been dropping in the last couple of years. But how about like total with institutions? Outflow still? I'm not, I'm not all, sure about institutions. All year net outflows. According, yeah, all year net oh, outflows. No kidding. Commodities in general, but gold is the biggest one. Wouldn't think that. Weird. You yeah. wouldn't think that if, if, if investors were thinking logically and investors and right, but we know that investors are humans and they do stupid things and they think irrationally, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And then uh, where does the, where does the weather uh, analysis come into play? Are you just like a, like a science weather geek or well, first like of all, for, for the chat, anytime I'm coming on, we're going to talk a little weather. We do, we like to do technical analysis on the weather maps. That's one of my things. Um, so weather, I always like to say weather and finance and trading, they go hand in hand. You got all this data. You're trying to sift through what matters and what doesn't. There are historical patterns to look back on. And uh, even our boy Fibonacci shows up on weather maps, like those low pressure systems. You see the cloud spiraling out. That's Fibonacci. So we see that in, uh, in nature all the time. So I always uh, like do, to pull up uh, weather maps and the charts uh, side by side. In my, how do you uh, think? Do you, have a, do you have an answer for me, Mike? Why do we see these Fibonacci ratios and, and the golden ratio show up in the markets, show up in, in, in science, you know, weather, plant life, all the things? Why, why do you think that is? Well, I don't know necessarily why we see it so much in nature, but I know that for uh, us as humans and traders, the Fibonacci golden ratio is something that is appealing to our eye. Like studies have shown that uh, we view the most attractive people are the ones that have the Fibonacci sequence or Fibonacci ratio in some of their uh, facial patterns. So these are things that we're just, for some reason, naturally drawn to. And um, yeah, we see that broader in nature as well. And that's like, the, Mo kind of like the Mona Lisa, for example. Uh-huh. Yeah, exactly. Well, the Mona so. Lisa, at first glance, it's like, all right, that's it. You know? Yeah. Well, um, yeah, we, we see more we to it see. than that. Yeah. We got to introduce Mike to uh, Bartoloni. You know Bart? James Bartoloni? Mm, I don't. All right. He would be so into this. Yeah. Eat some gummies or something before you go uh, hang out with him. You know, <laughs> he's going to he's gonna expand your mind, you know? I like it. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's talk about commodities. What are, what are you yes, paying attention to these days? What stands out to you, Mike? Yeah, so we've seen uh, this broad uptrend in commodities. And it's interesting, we've seen uh, kind of a rotation within commodities. You know, now we've got kind of the precious metals taking over uh, that, that clear breakout in gold. Uh, copper futures looking real good. Cocoa keeps doing its thing. Um, you know, everyone focuses on oil, and that's definitely had a, a nice run uh, this year. And, you know, I was just taking a look at some of the one month returns. And, you know, we've got stocks kind of across the board down a few percentage points, bonds are down and uh, commodities and commodity related stocks are up. So, um, you know, for those folks who are who are trading back in the you know, first half of 2008, um, kind of a similar pattern there. Um, interesting difference, though, right now is we have the dollar rallying, you know, above 106. Uh, back in an early 08, the dollar was you know like crashing into the low 70s. Yeah. So different there. Um, and you can also draw parallels to the first few months of uh, 2022. 
So a couple of years ago, it was kind of a, this real bear situation of falling stock prices, yields screaming higher, and commodities ripping. Um, we don't have you know quite that much bearish activity in the equity space, but you know we're, we're seeing trend lines break with the S and P. We've got small caps, like you said, negative on the year. The Dow is flat. So you know maybe we're in this kind of choppy pattern here as we get. Um, further into Q2. Um, so keep your eye on commodities. You know, the, the, it's the same old story. We got commodities and rates going higher. The longer that goes on, the more pressured stocks will be. Mike, is this not a bond market crash? Can we, Spencer, can you throw up slide three there to refresh the, uh, the memory of the folks here? Line go from the upper left to the lower right. No, is this not a bond? Straza says it's officially not a crash because volatility in the bond market is not elevated. But to Strauss's credit, he also says it doesn't matter what you call it, line is going down. Also true. Want to hear your thoughts there. Yeah, so, I mean, for it to be a crash, I, we, I think we need to see a, a pickup in downside momentum. Um, so, you know, looking at like the RSI on, I like to look at the government total treasury ETF, the GOVT, and that hit a 14-day RSI around 25 um, last October, we're at 33 now. So that is a year to date low, but the, you know, the downside on this isn't nearly as severe as what we saw in the, you know, first couple of weeks of the fourth quarter last year. So uh, we'll see if we, you know, how close we get to a retest of on GOVT 2160, we're at uh, 2219 now. Um, so looking at this chart right here of, uh, I guess we're looking at TLT on this one. Um, you know, we're not too uh, far down there. We can we're get looking these. looking at 30 uh, year bond futures. Yeah. Okay. The futures. Yeah. So, uh, you know, definitely wouldn't take much more than a few sharp days lower to retest that, that low. And that's also, I believe, like a psychological level on the rate front. I think like 5% on the 30 year is where we got to. We're at four and three quarters now. Um, so we could be there pretty quick. You know, and that could be the trigger to, send the S&P, you know, towards that, you know, psychological 10% correction level, uh, which would be, you know, 4,800 or whatever. Um, so yeah, this would be one to watch. Um, we could definitely get into a quick freak out mode if, if we do see that 30 year uh, print of five handle. Can you throw up, um, Spencer, can you throw up the new slide four? This is the GOVT that Mike was just describing. Straza and I, um, as much as we, you know, like to really focus on price and, you know, all of these indicators are very supplement, Straz and I both agree that a weekly RSI is, is really valuable. And in this case, you know, to your earlier point, in terms of momentum, it's really just been an orderly decline, momentum getting oversold, never getting overbought, like, I mean, just classic downtrends. I haven't seen overbought conditions in four years, the entire downtrend. Like this is just classic momentum behavior in a downtrend, no? Yeah, yeah. So with the RSI stuff, you know, we get, I guess, that 20 to 60 range that we see in bear markets, you know, like you said, never really touching over overbought levels. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we're seeing there. So, yeah, it's it's just one of those stay away kind of things. I mean, I mean, we're almost four years now into this bond bear market, um, you know, something we you know haven't seen in decades yield, yield wise. And then in terms of the overall draw, drawdown, um, something never before seen uh, since in past bear markets, we were always starting it at um, higher rates and then working up from there. But, you know, of course we had the super low rates in, uh, in 2020. So yeah, this, uh, this is key here. You know, we'll see if the last, you know, 18 months or so is a consolidation in the trend of larger degree, which is down. Um, but that would definitely surprise, you know, a lot of people, a lot of non-technicians who think that, you know, rates are more or less these days kind of mean reverting, whereas technicians, we can eye it, eye history and see that we get these multi-decade trends that tend to play out. And the new one's just kind of beginning. Well, I mean, we're, I mean, four years into it. I mean, so, um, definitely we felt the brunt of that in 2022. Um, it is possible that equities could become more comfortable with 
higher yields versus the the steep run up that we saw off low yields um, due to the like duration and convexity mechanics. When you go from one percent to two percent, that has a massive change yeah. on you know the global financial marketplace versus a four to five percent move. Yep. So that that's maybe one saving grace is for every incremental one percentage point higher move, it should have less impact on uh, at least bearish impact on stocks. Well, you're seeing it now. I mean, the most recent leg up, you're not hearing anything from these regional banks for a change. Yeah. And also consider that like fundamentally, um, a lot of the uh, the bond positions that had plagued them like this time a year ago, some yeah. of those things have matured and just rolled off. That's great so, point. Um, it's not, it's not as big of an issue, um, from the rate of change in interest rates, but also just from the nature of their balance sheet construct today. Mike, are you paying any attention to overseas bond markets? We found particularly developed Europe to be, you know, just a great kind of really a leading indicator, the U S bond market this cycle, but they're not, they, you know, rates overseas haven't been ticking higher as much as they have, you know, here in the U S recently. Yeah, it's interesting. If you, um, I like to look at uh, the IAGG, so for international. So domestically, we have AGG. Overseas, IAGG, both um, high-grade uh, credit and sovereigns. And yeah, it's, it's super interesting how well international bonds have, have performed while the AG is, is actually down on a total return basis in the last year. Um, and that's all the more impressive because we've got a strong dollar. You know, the dollar being higher over right. you know, the last six months, a year, um, typically that would weigh on on foreign bonds. Um, so, yeah, we're definitely seeing interesting strength there. Um, so I, I used to look at that a lot, but I haven't been looking at it, but I probably should have because that is it really is a remarkable uh, divergence there between uh, foreign and, and U.S. Yeah. Um, IGs. Interesting. Mike, talk to me about the trade. Talking bonds keep falling. Stocks are mixed at best yeah commodities yeah, so, have been leaders you know here we yeah, are so, it's april the 16th yeah so how i see this playing out is with bonds trending lower in, in the intermediate term commodities higher i think it really sets the stage for this corrective pattern in the s p uh, i would be surprised to see us break through five thousand to the downside um, we've got a 38.2 percent retracement uh, a little above 4800 i think on the s p based on the october low so yeah, there's that chart there. I mean, that could certainly play out. That would take us to close to flat on the year for the S&P. 10% um, yeah. correction level is a bit below that. Um, but yeah, I could definitely see us coming back down to, you know, close to that unchanged level in the year without things being too crazy. Um, and if you want like a fundamental catalyst for that, you know, rates inching back towards those October highs uh, could definitely do that. Oil, move, if it moves toward 100, that could fall in line with, with the narrative as well. Um, you know, one thing, we tend to see pretty bullish seasonality in April. We're not seeing that play out. But then seasonality didn't really show itself all that well in the first few months of the year. So I wouldn't be weighing seasonal trends as importantly as uh, last year because they really played out to a T in 2023. Um, but yeah, that being said, my my outlook here is, for this corrective pattern to play to unfold further over the next uh, bunch of weeks. Mike, are you saying seasonality just can't continue to be that good? I, I think it, it kind of ran its course. Maybe too many people were looking at it this year, and uh, yeah. but boy, yeah, it worked like it was just. It's been amazing the last couple of years. I mean, it's worked out so well. Yeah. Um, and it's just interesting in this in small caps. It's actually kind of working out. Uh, historically well, if, if you take a look at some of the seasonal seasonal charts there. But yeah, for the S&P, it's kind of fooled some folks this year, especially with some of the uh, um, election year. Um, you know, we typically see a weak first quarter. Of course, that didn't happen. Right. What are you going to New York, Mike? How about cryptos? Yeah. Yeah. Hold on, hold Crypto? on. I want to know when Mike's coming to New York. You never oh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just stuck in my little Florida... Dude, uh, cave over here. One of these days. comes to New York. Everybody uh, yeah. comes to New York. Everybody in finance, every technician at one point comes to New York. Mike's never up here. Yeah. Yeah. You, Joe, Sam Rowe, like you're always making me feel the FOMO when you're posting those pictures of 
uh, all those nice evenings out and all, all the nice steak dinners. You know, I love my steak. So not as much as we used to, Mike. Back in the day, <laughs> we used to do that a lot more. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. I don't like I don't like to leave Florida either, Mike. <laughs> Whereabouts yeah. are you? What's that? Where are you? Uh, Jacksonville, so northern nice. part. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, you're South in Georgia. Georgia Straza, really you know what? We should look up. Straza states, and I were there, what, like a year or two away. ago? Yes, we were there. I was just talking about that. Yeah, we were right at Jack's Beach. Oh, dang. There we I go. know. We should have yeah. hooked up. We should have hooked yeah. up next time. We'll, we'll, we'll be back in Jacksonville soon. Um, talking about crypto, how do you think about this sort of situation? Stuck below overhead supply. Got right back to where the crash started last time around. Struggled there. Pretty standard stuff. Pretty much. I mean, it snuck a peak there at all time highs. Um, if it if it had gotten up to seventy five and then traded back down to sixty today, that'd be a bit more concerning uh, from a false breakout perspective. Um, I mean, it was what seventy three for a, for a, a blip on the screen. Um, but yeah, just consolidating here, getting a lot of attention with the uh, the old having uh, mechanism coming up at the end of the week. We'll see how it, it trades after that. Um, but definitely saw, you know, this last weekend was kind of uh, telling. Like we saw Bitcoin, Ether trade sharply lower on some of the geopolitical stuff. So I don't know. And a lot of the uh, the altcoins really suffered in that mess too. So I think the some of the sentiment may be a little bit weaker here going forward based on that kind of um, you know, recalcitrant uh, reality that, you know, these things can definitely turn volatile when other parts of your portfolio are also uh, turning lower. So, yeah, I could see that continuing to consolidate here, 60 to 70 on Bitcoin. Um, so, yeah, nothing too exciting here until we bust through those uh, low 70s highs from earlier in the year. How do, you, how do you think about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies? Do you look at them as another asset class or is it just more like growth, more tech, more software? You know, do you, do you separate them or is it all the same shit? Yeah, I mean, for now, I think it's really tied into the tech thing. Um, a separate asset class. I mean, you pull out, you you pull back the spectrum on Bitcoin's chart. You can definitely make that case. You know, it does have its periods where it it does one thing totally different from stocks. I mean, it it, it sounds so nice to say that stocks and that they're like tech stocks and Bitcoin move together, but they definitely have the, their times when they don't. So. Um, and then there's all the studies that show if you if you include a, a small percentage of, of it into your portfolio with rebalancing, you do well. Of course, that's going to be true of anything that goes up a million percent in right. <laughs> a decade. Yeah. But um, yeah, over the long haul, I mean, it, it does seem to have um, characteristics that that buffer what's going on in, in the in the overall equity market. So yeah, separate asset asset space, I could definitely buy that. Yeah. Uh, can we bring up slide 18? I just want to ask Mike. So wh wh where are we in this? I mean, you're saying we're near the end of, of, of this cycle. Yeah. So, well, this this thing got a, a lot of play yesterday on, on uh, Twitter when I share it. You got to be only uh, you got to be careful with this. Um, at any given time, you can kind of point to intermediate or short term trends and stock sponsored commodities and kind of handpick where we are in the in this stage um so that's true major preface with this but you know in general again bonds last four years uh generally trending lower stocks since you know june to october 2022 generally trending up commodities um since 2020 to 2022 trending up um so to me all it's really saying is that we're in an inflationary cycle like we were in the deflationary cycle in the 2000s. So this chart was meaningless. Um, you have to keep in mind that um, this business cycle, the market cycle analysis uh, was pretty much created in the 1970s when we had an inflationary environment. You know, when bonds go down, stocks also go down and this commodities go up. Um, so that's the general theme here. Um, you could also call it kind of a reflation trade right now with some of the emerging growth patterns we're seeing like out of China and some global PMI readings. So that would kind of support the idea that, you know, better growth, more demand for commodities, also good for stocks. 
not great for bond prices as come out as inflation expectations tick up. Um, so yeah, generally stage four, are we there? I don't know, but in terms of price action, um, definitely the last few months and then stepping out to the last few years, I mean, it generally seems like we're on this upward swing stage four, uh, part of the business cycle. But again, this can, this is All secondary. Right. So, secondary so don't overthink it. And this don't is overthink a four it. year. This is like a four year sort of like mentality. I mean, nothing's perfect, obviously, but that's how you kind of think about it. Again, that's where it gets tough. I, I don't think it's just, just no hard and fast rules on how, the, how long these cycles right. last. They can be a few quarters to, I mean, a decade or so. So yeah, that's, that's up for, up for debate. Cool. All right, guys, I dropped the link to Mike Zicardi's Twitter in, in the description. Um, again, I, as I said before, I don't, I don't know if there's anyone that tweets more charts than Mike. You do a heck of a, a job, Mike. It's a tweeting job, machine. Buddy. Yeah, um, I'm a chart psycho. There's no doubt about it. Chart psycho. I've been <laughs> called worse things. Sure. <laughs> thanks a lot, Mike. All right, thanks, guys. Good to see you. Yeah. How about Tommy uh, Tuberville doing a little, uh, you know, a couple of Pico purchases there for him? Not, yeah, not a lot of money. We'll get we'll get to it. Tommy Tubbs hit, hitting up the pharma uh, or health Random. Walgreens. Yeah. yeah, I like his strategy. They kick it out of the Dow and you buy it. That's not a bad strategy, Tommy Tubbs. I mean, he's been here before. Yeah, but he, he bought did. nothing. He didn't Don't buy anything. Thunder. Wait, wait on it. I'm, I'm going to lob one up to you. I'm lobbing one up to you from the chat. You'll like this. Shouldn't Bitcoin trade higher with geopolitical instability? I mean, that is the purpose of decentralized assets. This is what I, this is what we said. We talked about yesterday a little bit, or I, I mentioned that, right? Well, it's worth mentioning again because it sounds yeah. like somebody's been hanging out in some dark corners of the internet. Don't listen to what they tell you. Well, Everything do you that think they Bitcoin talk, is going up because of geopolitical instability. You are probably staying up late at night watching some conspiracy. You know, you're hanging out in some dark corners of the internet, like Stras. So everything they've told you about Bitcoin is a why. What yeah. matters is that. Wine go up, it trades with the risk assets, right? It trades with the risk assets. We have the data. <laughs> not, not only is everything that the early laser eyes, laser eyed people told you about Bitcoin wrong, but if you're bullish, thank God it was wrong because yes. it would have been a disaster if the stuff they were saying would have been right. Yes. Okay. Yes. Stratus yep. is absolutely right. I hate to give him so much credit, but everything he said is absolutely true. We have the data. But the way you put it is perfect, Straza. Not only were they wrong, but Thank God the they reason were. it's done so well is because of just how wrong they were. So be thankful. And we all are. All of us have made money in Bitcoin. We're all thrilled about it. But we're thankful that they were wrong. Yes. And this, and this stuff isn't rocket science. Guess, guess who knows this? The SEC. Like, these guys are dying to be regulated. Talk to Brian Armstrong. Dying to be regulated. Why won't the SEC regulate them? They don't want to legitimize the asset class the worst thing that they could do spencer get brian armstrong on the show that would be so fun that would be i'll cool. do my best come on all, spencer. all their investor relations uh yeah yeah uh hey, listen i am the host of the best morning show in finance we would love to have you on as a guest send, send them our send them some of our reports uh, i actually speaking of reaching out to guests i i've been thinking about reaching out to jim chanos i haven't done it but i i've been I'll thinking be about it i'll reach out to him Jim Chanos yeah. is the reason I met my wife. I, I know. Would love yeah. to get Mark Cahodes on here. Yeah, you'll have to tell him that story, JC. I, I have I've tried. To I've tried with Mark. Uh, I had dinner with him you. recently. I told him. He started laughing. Yeah. He's like, that's ridiculous. He's like, you stay uh, there out. <laughs> can we bring up the earnings calendar, please? We, uh, we got a few more uh, this morning. I want to get to Morgan Stanley, Bank of America, Johnson & Johnson. Uh, this this week is sort of the the, the beginning of the uh of this is where the fun begins, as, as they say, right? So let the fun begin. JC, is this fun for you? Or are you having fun yet? <laughs> season. I wish they, I wish they, I, that's what I like about crypto. You don't have to I know. do this earnings not. I know. <laughs> they were just talking about that in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Morgan Stanley, nice beat on the top of the bottom line and in most of their business segments as well. I think net interest income um, was, 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 uh, was up more than expected. So, um, oh no, it was an investment banking. That's what it was. Investment banking, uh, more than expected. Yeah, up sixteen percent year now? over year. Morgan. Yeah, Morgan. Family. Okay. 
Do we have that chart? I thought we did. Maybe not. Yeah, we have um, it. Morgan's run into like a shelf of old highs. Um, Bank of America is still trying to. Oh, yeah, that's when you zoom out too. Big level. Big level. I forgot about this. Hey, now. Love these bases. We do love these bases. You know, we've been uh, waiting for this Morgan Stanley base to break out yeah. for years. That I years. forgot. I, I forgot it even looks like this. Um, but the important point here is that this is energy. This, these are the same chart patterns. We talk about the XLE, right? This multi-decade situation that's going on that we're like just now kind of resolving. Same with a lot of stuff in financials, whether it's our big six bank index, Morgan, there's other individual names like uh, that look like this, broker dealer, in, broker dealer indexes look like this. Um, so maybe things are just getting started. And this goes into the same value cyclicals trade a lot of times. Like we, we've been on here talking about commodity stocks, commodity stocks, commodity stocks, materials and energy. But my whole career, whenever I'm talking about materials and energy, I'm also usually talking about and focusing on financials and also even industrials. Am I wrong, JC? No. Right. Not those this time four, not. Those four groups tend to fall into the rising rate outperformers camp or the value trade camp, the cyclical camp. No. Yeah. No. You know, we when uh, you were refreshing your coffee, Spencer and I were uh, discussing just the the massive difference between large cap financials and small cap financials. Yeah. Right. Ton of regional banks and small cap financials. When in large caps, you got these big banks, but you also got Berkshire Hathaway is the largest component by far. Right? Insurance. A lot of insurance. Uh, more, yep. more capital market stuff. More of the good stuff, less of the bad. Yes, that's a good way to put it. More and of the better stuff. And right, capital markets, insurance, right. Berkshire Hathaway, ton of industrials there. Ton of and, insurance, obviously. You're right. You're and right. you know, really, healthcare is no different. The, the, the large caps have more of the good and less of the bad because there's just too much biotech. That's exactly what we said. It's all, yeah. That's exactly what we said. It's almost like we've been working together for a while. Almost, almost. And then Spencer drops this moving average crossover nonsense like you just got yeah, here. Like, come on, Spencer. Don't say that New in here? public. Yeah, <laughs> stop. Man. Uh, speaking, of healthcare, speaking of healthcare, uh, do we have that J&J &J chart? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know what the stock is doing since the open. Uh, and this chart won't even show it either. But the earnings were this morning and they... They they were they were fine. They were good. They uh they refined their guidance a little bit, made the range a little bit tighter. They are also raising their dividend uh by five cents a share. Uh that's a quarterly dividend from buck nineteen to buck twenty four. Um yeah, it's it's J and J. I mean it's you know. I mean another one that looks real toppy here, but probably gonna be just fine. Yeah. <laughs> The pride of New Brunswick, New Jersey, right there. Johnson Johnson. Yeah, that's right. Are they really um, from New Brunswick? They are really. There's basically every major pharmaceutical company is headquartered in New Jersey. Mm. Um, almost seems like it. I think Pfizer is, J and J, a bunch of others. And why? Because it's just cheaper to be there than New York, where you're close I, enough. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> isn't Pfizer right on uh isn't Pfizer right on 42nd Street right off like on um, Park Avenue and like 40 like I'm 40th sure Street? they have an office in Manhattan it's a pretty <laughs> sweet office isn't it uh the only other th headline I wanted to mention was uh Live Nation LYV getting the beats this morning uh Wall Street Journal reporting that the the, the DOJ is preparing an antitrust lawsuit against the owners of Ticketmaster Everybody clapped for that. We all like that news. Ticketmaster sucks. So, LYV down. Last I saw, it was down about uh, 10%. Not uh, know. Pfizer headquartered in New York, New York. This, Whatever. The headquarters, the headquarters police over here. Whatever. Yeah, like, like coupons. Yeah, right. Pindao Dow headquartered in Ireland, right? Fucking. It's not my <laughs> fault. <laughs> Okay. Um, I don't give a shit where they're headquartered. They decided to do it in Dublin, not in China. Right. And right it doesn't right, look right, like right. most China stocks. Right. That's maybe just a coincidence. Maybe. All right. LYV actually bounced off the open, but yeah, it is down today off this uh, report of a pending antitrust lawsuit. Um, so I don't, have, 
I don't have to pay eighty dollars in fees every time I want to buy a ticket to a basketball. I, game. I don't know. T, T, TBD on that one. We'll see what the uh, DOJ has to say about it. But hold on, can we do a quick little morning rundown here? I think this is a yeah. big deal. Uh, yeah. The market has stocks have given up all of their early morning gains. You've got uh, uh, S and P and the Nasdaq both down. Small cap Russell two thousand down at full percent already uh, on the day. Bond futures getting the crap kicked out of them again. Uh, Thirty year bond futures down almost a full percent. Uh, silver down a percent and change. Copper down two percent. Gold flat up a little bit. Crude oil pretty much flat, just down a little bit. Uh, dollar mixed in early trading, slightly higher there. Um, rates keep going up. Bonds keep going down, guys. Um, you know, some early gains in the stock market gave them all up. All right. It's been at least a week, maybe more, since we've talked, since we've done the hot corner. So Get it. let's do the hot corner now. Tommy Tubbs in the house. The Baker Bros. Yeah. Hot corner. So hot right now. Tommy Tubbs is back at it. Uh, usually he's out here buying commodity stocks or Dow stocks. This is a little bit different because it's a former Dow stock. 15 to 50 grand is the range for both of his purchases. Uh, one was Walgreens, old Dow component, and the other one was Humasite, which is biotech. The one that really stands out to me is another political filing, the old Devon Energy. I like this name. You know, oil and gas stocks have been hot. This one was coming off of, you know, some key lows just a few weeks ago, or I guess about back in February now. Uh, but back above its AV WAP from its old highs, I think Devon Energy probably going to be good stock to be in uh, to the back half of the year or for the remainder of the year. Go back to the table, please. I can think of worse stocks. Yeah. Uh, and then we have a 13, an original Form 13 filing, which always stands out. So just over 5%. This is for Hawk Ridge Capital, APPN software stock. Doesn't yeah, I know that one. Yeah. Uh, and then I want to really just break into a conversation about Baker Bros. Did you guys see this article? I just love it when the Wall Street Journal reports on stuff that we've talked about months and quarters ago. Uh, so in this case, they did a nice little, um, I don't know, what do you call it? A, a big story, not a little story. Uh, it was just a tra it was just a trend like piece. Uh, it, it was expose. Uh, it wasn't that big. No, no, no. It, it, it was just a, a short little piece just about how Baker Bro Baker Bros kind of got started and this massive bet that they made and how profitable it was and how unusual it is for them to have returned uh the whatever the eight billion dollars to 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 shareholders um you want to know or, something or, or to their investors you know something? yeah I'm I'd gonna read, read that i I would read that article all right, we're going to send it to you. you it was, you want me to send I, it to you? Okay. I would actually read it. For someone who doesn't read anything, the Baker Bros are such badasses. Yeah, I'll I'm read it. Right yeah. I wish it was more of like a documentary, but hey, you know. I don't I I'll I lost it. it. Hold on. Give me a second. Uh, here we go. I mean, I, I I read it. It wasn't very long, but it was it was it was, it was a nice little read and obviously you I a, you read a lot of stuff. So I'm not uh, surprised. Yeah, yeah, I like to read. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A two a two a two-decade bet on a biotechnology company turned into a roughly $8 billion windfall for investors in a New York hedge fund earlier this year. Baker Bros Advisors, a hedge fund firm run by brothers Felix and Julian Baker, in 2003 invested in CGen, developer of next-generation cancer treatments. Pfizer bought the company for $43 billion last year. The firm held a nearly 25% stake in CGen and reaped about $10 billion in proceeds when the acquisition closed in December. Gave back most of uh, that to its investors earlier this year, people, people familiar said, this was one of the industry's largest ever returns of capital. So this is, and if we have the chart, throw it up, Fonz, we should have it. And by uh, industry, this is biotech in particular, yeah. tough to get a $10 billion profit in a small biotech. Very tough. And then the article went on to, I mean, this is incredible. The chart shows you everything you need to know. Article went on to talk about how not only do they, you know, have they outperform biotech, you know, consistently for a while. Uh, I think last year biotechs did seven percent; they did about twenty. But that they make very large, concentrated, long-term bets. These, this is why this is our favorite, pretty much hands down, for the hot corner. You want somebody who you know their time frame is going to be long. You know they have conviction and they're going to come in and make a big splash. 
right? And they're going to be there for a while and probably keep buying as opposed to, and I know this well, because I used to work in the industry, some sort of long, short equity hedge fund that has 100 different portfolio managers, all with different teams and different allocations, right? And they're buying, each one's buying a little bit of stock. These guys have 18 employees. They come out and they buy 25% of the outstanding shares in these biotech companies, hold them for decades. These are the guys that we pay attention to in the hot corner for good reason. So I thought, I mean, this investment is one of the best I've ever witnessed in my career, seen a hedge fund uh, kind of do. I know it took a long time, but God, if you're holding and you were in their fund, it's kind of like private equity investment. That's why they return the capital. If you're in this for 20 years, you probably want to get paid. <laughs> So. Yeah, and a lot of those investors were like endowments and pensions and, okay. and that jazz. And this is a great example as to why we look at the hot corner, why we created the hot corner in the first place. Just because there's an institution buying a stock or Uncle Warren or Carl Icahn or Nelson Peltz, et cetera, et cetera, the list of Tommy Tubbs. Just because they're buying doesn't mean we do. Nancy Pelosi's YOLOing Tesla calls doesn't mean I'm going to do that. But we do want to take a little closer look. That's it. What an investment this was. Uh, so we brought along a couple charts. These are some things that Baker Bros are in now. Do we have the Baker Bros ready? Yeah, throw them up, Fonz. I love okay. that we do this, by the way. This is great. Mm -hmm. This really is great. This is like, you know, watching like Buffett's portfolio, but like specifically in biotechs and arguably I'm better. I'm telling you, they're the best. Uh, these guys are so good. So we really watch them closely. There's a handful of firms that we watch closely. Just throw up the charts. We don't need the holding percent. I'll read it off. Problem is, the charts don't look great for a lot of their holdings right now. Throw up Insight. Yeah, but they usually don't, right? They're buying just mm. tiny garbage biotechs. They don't have to work. Their time horizon is not our time horizon, which is something to keep in mind. Their time horizon is very different than ours. Are we going to do the charts or should we move? Yeah, there we go. So, Be all right, Beijing, we'll do, we'll do Beijing. This is Chinese genomics. They own 10% of the outstanding shares. It's been a big position for a long time for them, but tough to buy something like this. Like, sure, maybe this is another UNH and they dig in here and it's not a top. But for now, I mean, tough to enter trades like this. Next, do Insight. Same thing, right? I guess you could buy the lower bounds, but we'd rather be buying a breakout of a multi-year range and then one more kind of the same story acadia pharmaceuticals they own 26 percent of outstanding shares in this one again why we love them so much these three stocks together insight makes up 26 percent of their portfolio beijing about 22 percent acadia 15 percent looking at almost three quarters you know of their aum in these three names so continue to watch them closely try to catch the next you know c gen uh, but for now, not seeing much in their holdings. Yeah, throw up the last two. Go crazy. Madrigal. Madrigal. How do I do? Terrible. <laughs> Next largest holding. This is about 6% of their assets under management. 10% uh, uh, of outstanding shares. So, like, every time they buy a company, they're they're owning, like, they go big. They go and yeah. and the article even said like what you want. They're concentrated, but that's how to yeah. do it. You're gonna die if you want to diversify your biotech portfolio. Just buy the XBI. They're good at what they do. I want to yeah. follow fund managers who have the confidence to make concentrated bets like this. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, so MDGL probably looks better than any of them. We will buy this breakout all day. We'll be talking about it on the hot corner. Trust me when it happens. Uh, and then throw up the last one. Rhythm Pharmaceuticals, we could probably buy the old highs here, 37 and a quarter. Talk about this one tomorrow. That's all we got. Uh, oh, in Rhythm, they own 10.6% of outstanding shares. It is about uh, 3%, a little more than 3% of their portfolio. That's it for the Baker Bros portfolio review. All right. Like uh, Steve has been talking about the Baker Bros in the hot corner for... Long time, um, hot corner goes out every single day. It is a free daily note we put out. If you want to get the hot corner delivered to your inbox, nice job. in the description of this video, just scroll down on YouTube. It is right there. It says hot corner, and there's a link to sign up and get it delivered every single day. We have a lot of fun.
the Wednesday Great. review is, is 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 a lot of fun. All right, we got speaking of uh, free notes we put out. The proprietor of our other free note is Patrick Donawilla, and he's here. So let's bring him on. Bumper. Bye, JC. Yeah. Oh, JC, you're at you're on the bumper. What did he just? Okay. <laughs> Run the bumper. <laughs> Yo yo, how you right, doing? We traded a JC for a Patrick. That's what we're. <laughs> that's that's how we're gonna finish these last twelve minutes. That's all right. That's all right. I guess. Uh, Q3. Well, Irish goodbye. Oh, uh, so what's new, Patrick? Oh, you know, it's a it's busy week. It's Tuesday. We'll see if we get that turnaround. Is that a new office plant? Or are you growing weed back there? It looks like it needs water. Uh, it's, it, it needs some water. Definitely needs some water. It's got its friend over there on the other side. Uh, but yeah, I'm not, not too much of a, of a botanist. Don't, don't have a very good green thumb. Why is, you must have a new girlfriend. Why are there plants in your apartment? <laughs> no, no. Anyway, um, what are you, what are you guys watching? I mean, it's kind of been dead. I'm it's watching been, uh, 52 week lows list massively, um, outpaced the 52 big highs list. I'm, well, uh, I'm, what about UNH? Didn't UNH report? Uh, they should have just reported, right? Yeah, yeah. Big B. They were, man, they were like falling off a cliff before this. Big save. Nice. Nice. I mean, they had to save. That, that was like the one chance, right? Yep. So they, they did it, huh? You didn't want you don't want to see the largest stock in the Dow complete a multi-year top like that in yeah. a in a bull market, right? Would you say this is a failed top yet? Like, do you think this gets us to the top end of the range? I mean, it's the momentum and the shake, right? Because you had a little shake out to multi-year lows. It's the momentum and the shake that you want to start a move like that. So I, yeah. I, I would say, you know, uh, probability is not low. Yeah. And again, these ranges, I mean, how many times have we seen this thing ping off the top and then to the bottom of the range and then back to the top? So we were talking about this yesterday, Pat, like we're trend followers. And a large part of what we do, by definition, is betting on trends persisting. And by definition, again, trends are when prices are either moving steadily upward or steadily downward. But you can also bet on the lack of trend per persisting. Right? Sometimes we're simply in a trendless environment or a range-bound environment, and you see chart patterns like UNH right, play out due to that trendlessness, and you can bet on that persisting. So something like UNH... Just like John Deere the other day, you sell premium in it and you bet on more sideways until you really get a resolution. Trading ranges is hard. Yeah, very frustrating. Unless you know it's a range, which a lot of the times it doesn't reveal itself until you're you're pretty deep into it. Yeah. Even then, you know, there's just so much slop when you're trading ranges. Uh, it's even when you have well-defined upper and lower bounds, picking your spots can be hard. So yeah. And, and then we got um we got Netflix on Thursday, right? Yes, we yeah, do. So that's the, the old uh the, the the forgotten magnificent stock. <laughs> they kind of kick beast. off big tech, Spencer, what a right? Beast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Netflix is usually like the early one, but they, they're on Thursday along with um uh there's a couple others. We have nope, I lied. Netflix is the big one. Yeah. You know, and, and this is one of those stocks that makes most of its moves around earnings and then just kind of tends to sit around for a while and then just gaps higher the next time or gaps lower. What a beast, uh, man. Yeah. Man, it's recovering from a 75% drawdown. Lost three quarters of its value. It's like Facebook kind of. And kind of a similar recovery, right? You have the very V-shaped recovery yeah. for, for Meta and for uh, for Netflix here. Hasn't quite broken out, but if it does, that kind of opens the gates for a thousand there. Google, Meta, Amazon, uh, Netflix shown here, all really closing in on some monster breakouts above the prior cycle highs. Just as people are starting to throw out their big tech trade, and those are like the uh, those are like the the forgotten. Um, thanks. I feel like Nvidia has just kind of eaten everyone's lunch. Yeah, it's funny how quick, quickly you know, tastes and preferences among investors change. I watched the um, lunch show 
on one of the networks and they all give a trade at the end. And yesterday, and this is not, you know, unusual the past few weeks, all everybody is energy or materials. So, <laughs> oh, man. Well, I mean, these are the same right? people who chase mag seven, right? The last few years. So I would not snooze on these stocks right here, especially the ones that could play catch up. Right. You're so talking about the, comes or the NVIDIAs or the super micros. I still think still very constructive on those. Don't get me wrong. But something like Meta, Google, Amazon, Netflix, just now maybe getting that breakout done. You could just play to the primary target, right? Or going back to the range conversation, playing the range in Apple, right? Yeah, I was, I was about to bring that up. I mean, how about Apple, right? Yeah. Finally looking decent, looking like it found a short-term bottom. I know it kind of got slapped down at the 50-day yesterday, but... I like buying Apple here. You know that, Spencer. I, I think you can almost look at the price action and the others that, that we're talking about that I just named and, and then say, okay, what's Apple going to be doing if those other four are breaking out above their prior cycle highs, probably not making, you know, fresh multi-month lows. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so you mentioned how the energy and materials trade was kind of getting a little crowded, right? I mean, it's, it's had such a spectacular move and it's been one of the only pockets of strength the last few weeks. But, you know, we had that massive bearish engulfing candle in silver and gold on Friday, but they still ended positive on the week. They still ended at multi-year highs. So, you know. I like, I like the way you have this drawn, Pat. Yeah. What, what, what about it? The uh, the little inset there with the engulfing candle? That's important too, but where it's happening, right? Like this is a big level. And I like how you zoomed out to those, those pivot lows from uh, early 2010s, right? So you have a shelf of old highs here from the last cycle. But mm -hmm. the, this resistance level is more than that. This is a big polarity zone going back over a decade. Exactly. Yeah. So I think I mean thirty four looks like it's next. Do you have, do you have a kind of line in the sand for for silver? You think it goes all the way back to twenty eleven highs? I, I'm with you. I think we keep climbing up the right hand side of this base, but I think like this is a perfect level to be patient at. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to be buying. You know, adding silver exposure right here, right now. I traded yeah. silver like a few weeks ago. Very small scale. Uh, but I think this move is still materializing. I think you want to get the resolution, a decisive resolution. Right? You want you want this base in silver to look more like the one in gold, taking out yeah. the highs from a few years ago. Then you want to start putting on risk. Yeah, it's almost, it's almost like when we saw biotech start to go earlier this year and everybody piled on and everyone got excited. It's a little bit like that. Yeah. It's like, okay, maybe we just need a little bit more time. <laughs> yeah, Wavy nailed it. I don't like that everyone's talking about this commodity theme right now. I never like it when people talk. Yeah, but even even if you were, well, when I, even if we, broadly, broadly speaking, all-star charts was early to the trend, right? So so just because they're agreeing with, so you you don't like that they agree with you. I hate it. <laughs> Especially, on, yeah. It doesn't make you not, it doesn't make you wrong. It doesn't make you not right. No, and being contrarian is usually wrong. Right. Right. So so being with the crowd, as much as people talk shit about it, is usually the right side to be on. Yeah. It's at inflection points or turning points uh, where you want to be contrarian. And that's that's the trickiest thing. And that's I think a great thing to keep in mind early on. You know, if we are in the early ish stages of a new bull market, uh, because I think Tell it's really easy. Tell Mike Sicardi then. Well, <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, but I feel like it's really easy to see every piece of, of you know, every nugget you see as, as some piece of sentiment data. Um, when, like you said, you know, sometimes you have to be with the crowd during the trend. Yeah. Uh, so commodities probably need more time. Pro probably entering a little cool off period here. What a streak they had. Same with energy. Uh, I think patience pays. I think look to groups like financials. I look to these big big tech trades. I'm 100% with you, Pat. I think Netflix is the perfect stock for this. Yeah, right. To, Remember, to save too, the day. It, it has the potential to save the day kind of thing. And look at the price action in Apple. Just these past few sessions as the market's getting absolutely trashed. Uh, these names are inherently defensive as much as some people might not like to hear it. Yeah, you kind of mentioned it in yesterday's show. You're talking about how it's kind of like a kind of like a safe haven or I don't know if that's the right word, but a place for people to hide out. They treat them like, yeah, a lot of managers will treat these stocks like cash. 
yeah treasury position especially apple but i don't I see mean, why google should be any different or amazon right these are safe quality names with the um, amount of cash apple has it, yeah it could, right. it could be cash right great point i remember a time when apple was trading at like net cash yeah it's crazy um so anyway i i think if we enter some sort of corrective phase you know energy is kind of getting donned as as the defensive group uh these days because that's worked re in recent years or in recent history but look back to these mega techs like the old leaders to hold up a lot better than the broader market and maybe maybe be trending higher maybe be completing these breakouts like the ones that we just talked about amazon google netflix in a corrective tape so yeah I think that's a good place to kind of park it and hang out and let this whole thing blow over yeah, you don't, you don't hear too many people talking about the Amazon breakout. I thought people would have been all over that, but me too. Uh, Pat, momentum. Did you see my tweet? Uh, the momentum divergence. Yes, yes. So, uh, what are you? Pat and I studied for the CMT together back in the day. Uh, we learned about momentum and the daily RSI 14 specifically in the CMT curriculum, and momentum divergences are just weird. You yeah, know, so I'm trying tough. to make sense of these multi-monthers that we've had momentum peaked in December for most things. And uh, I think, you know, the past few days, we got, we got some movement there. Yeah, it's funny, you know, on, on the chart, of, on Alfonso's chart of the day, uh, somebody replied and they were like, oh, so that momentum divergence finally mattered four months later. Oh, that's funny. And it's, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, okay, it was there the whole time. We're not saying it didn't matter, uh, but what are you going to do about it, right? It's tough to do while the market's going up. You got to kind of wait for the market to actually come in before you really give those things a chance. Um, yeah. So it's it tough. Matters. Those things can diverge for months, even years, even years. A lot of times you want to give price time to catch up to momentum. And other times you want to give momentum time to catch back up to price. Right? So yes. you see these waning, 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 waning divergences. And then you'll see like another blowout overbought reading that kind of you could draw a trend line through the RSI and it breaks. This time it was the opposite though. We saw this waning, waning, waning momentum reading. Throw my chart up again of the RSI 14. Uh, momentum making lower highs, lower highs, lower highs with each new price high. And then finally kind of the floor falling out. I don't usually draw support that resistance was, lines. Yeah. I'm trying to show the range and that momentum is kind of plunging to a level that we haven't seen since October. Remember what the market was doing back in October. Yes. That's where momentum is uh, again now. And we're taking out those highs from the last time we were overbought. For me, this was confirmation. JC didn't want to discuss this. So what, give me give me your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're making a great point. Like it diverged to such a low level that it's just like, man, that then it really starts to matter. And then, I was going to say, you know, one thing to help in that scenario when RSI is diverging for a while is yeah. if it stops hitting oversold, like once once it stops, oh. rolling, or I'm sorry, yeah, overbought, yeah. that's kind of a red flag right there. That's saying, okay, it's yeah. really kind of losing losing steam here. So. so I'm referring to the highs that came with an overbought reading as confirmed highs and the ones that didn't as unconfirmed highs. Like you want to treat them as suspect, right? And, yeah. and more likely to fail. Yeah. All right, anyway, too much chart talk. Uh, we ran out of time for recess today. <laughs> I, I don't even have a recess. You guys got anything? I got nothing. Let's skip it. Pat, you got a recess? I, I got nothing for you. All right, cool. Space is uh, at 11, guys. Chart request the, Yeah, an hour from now. An hour from now, right. space is um, three hours from now, right? Chart request live, 1 o'clock Eastern time yes. right here on the channel. Send your request to the inbox questions at stockmarketmedia.com or just hang out in the chat for that. And um, that's it. Smash the like. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike Zaccardi. Thank you, chat. Go make some money. Cheers.